Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. You mustn't go down to Cromwell Street. You mustn't go down there at all. Bad things happen down Cromwell Street, so please heed your parents' call. Why can't I go down Cromwell Street? Father, I won't go for long. Mother, can I go down Cromwell Street? Is it really so wrong? You mustn't go down Cromwell Street. That's where trouble is found. At 25 on Cromwell Street, secrets are in the ground. So I finally managed to do it, to take her head off, and then her legs. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another I Could Murder a Podcast. I'm Tom Norris and I'm joined once again by the guy that exists. It is Ben Carter. I exist indeed, Tom, in your mind and in your heart. And it's good to be here. It is. And before we start, Ben, there's been a few people saying, oh, Tom, stop picking on Ben. And <laughs> to those people, I want to say, <laughs> fuck off. No, I was going to say, Ben, you're a c- cunning co-host. Thank you. You're a f- Funny guy. Thank you very much. Um, and you're all right. Thank you so much. I will take all three of those. Take them to the bank. Take them to the bank, I shall. This week, perhaps our most heavily requested case is finally here. It's the case of John Bonet Ramsey. No, it's not. Oh, I thought we were Fred on Rose, the vote. Fred and Rose West, mate. Oh, it's not the Insta vote. That We've already done that one. Oh, God. That was good acting. Because I generally thought, what is he? Th- what is he? Thank where is he so going? Much. This might be. We'll see how it goes. If <laughs> We've turned a new leaf. Well, the leaf is it's autumn and it's going a bit decrepit and crumbling away. But <laughs> anyway, it is Fred and Rose West, like Ben said, a huge case and one that was requested many a time. But yeah, heavily, heavily requested case. Tom, uh, people have been on at us to cover Fred and Rose since the very beginning. Yes, indeed. And look, before we start a bit of housekeeping, we've got our socials at Could Murder a Pod on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And we've also got a Patreon. If you're not getting enough content, mm-hmm. you're desperate for more, go over there and there's over 40 Minnesotans on there with cases that you guys vote for yourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And there's video and audio versions of every single episode over there. So if you're a listener, if you're a viewer, um, why not get a chair, get comfortable and get on over to patreon.com. Or you can walk around because you've got the audio, like you said. Forward slash could murder a pod. But also, yes. So there you go. And also we have a store. If you're looking for some merchandise, icmap.store. And as Tom mentioned, we are on all social platforms. Instagram, we are very, very close to 5,000 followers. So if you are a listener, if you're someone that's been aware of us for a long time, why not head over and give us a follow? We post pretty much every day uh, updates on cases we're going to be covering, Patreon episodes coming up, and just other interesting random facts about true crime. Yes, indeed. But let's get into it, Ben. Someone said to me the other day when I was wearing this, this is a Rose West jumper. So I decided I'd wear it for today's case. Do you agree? It's very Rose, yeah. Though I looked, tried, tried to find a picture of her wearing something similar. I couldn't find it, but it looks like something she would wear. Yeah, absolutely. For those listening, I can't really describe it. Because, is it blue? Is it purple? Yeah, Ben's colour blind. Uh, anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> this case, Tom, is... I know we say this about a, a lot of the cases we cover. This is consistently dark. Just when you think it can't get any worse, it gets lots worse. For me, I knew a little bit about the case, a little bit about kind of the headlines in terms of what they did, but I didn't know much about kind of their childhoods and what was going on in their formative years, and it's bleak. So what I thought I would do is prepare for you and for our audience some random facts, just to break it up if it does get a bit too dark here. Some random facts about Gloucestershire. People moaning about how long it takes us to get into episodes. <laughs> but go on, let's talk Let's talk about Gloucestershire. Oh, absolutely. No, I'm going to save these. If we get to a point, and maybe producer Dan um, okay. could uh, kind of keep an, c- keep an eye and ear on this. But if it does get a bit too, oh, then I've got some facts about Gloucestershire okay. just to lighten the mood. Um, Dan, that falls on your shoulders. You I'm decide if we need. Absolutely buzzing. A Gloucestershire fact. 
There you go. So yeah, Fred and Rose West, we're going to go through their childhoods now until they eventually do meet and then jump on the timeline. This is a very big case. It is a big timeline. There's lots of things to discuss. So let's get cracking. Absolutely. We're not going to be able to cover every single detail um, because that would be, we could probably be a two or three parter here. Well, yeah, there's, lo- there's loads of uh, podcasts that just, just, just do this case and they're six or seven parts alone. So it's like, it's a very, very big case. But uh, yeah, we're going to cover all the bits that we think, you know, our audience would want to hear her about. Frederick Walter Stephen West was born on the 29th of September 1941 in a small picturesque farming village of Much Markle, which is in Herefordshire. He was the oldest and first surviving child of Walter and Daisy West. Um, the couple had conceived eight children in total, though only six of them survived to the, the oldest boy and very much the mother's favourite boy as well. Growing up, uh, Fred was described by his auntie as he's always been such a nice boy. And one neighbour described him as a bit cheeky, a bit mouthy, but that was the way these kids were. Yeah, and he was um, obviously a large family. He was uh, raised on a farm. From the off, Fred was a very striking baby uh, with long, curly blonde hair and bright, piercing blue eyes. Compared to the other five West children, he very much stood out. And from the off, he was described as Mammy's blue-eyed boy. So from what Ben's described there, it's quite a picturesque kind of setting. It's on a farm, six children... You know, mummy's boy. It, it sounds very kind of, yeah, kind of fairy tale but that was very much not the case. West was actually sexually abused by his mother and he allegedly lost his virginity to her. He also said that she forced him to perform acts of bestiality, mm. which obviously is, is horrible. West would go on later on to say that his father as well would have incestuous relations with young girls, although this was never confirmed. Fred's mother um, sexualized him uh, from a very, very young age. Uh, and this is a trait that we'll see that, that Fred goes on to conduct in his own life, in his later years and in his formative years. Very much views sex as kind of a transactional act and one that can just occur as and when he likes. So um, that will be something that stays with him for many, many years. As, as we mentioned, the family were, were kind of born and raised on a, on a farm where they all kind of also, similar to last week's case, they were, would all uh, skip school and help support the family farm. Didn't have any sewage. D- sorry, didn't, <laughs> didn't have any plumbing. Um, so they had plenty of sewage. Plenty of sewage. The cottage had no electricity and was heated by a log fireplace. The cottage also had no plumbing and the family would share a bucket as a form of toilet. They had to take turns in emptying this bucket into a nearby rat-infested pit. Though they did have panoramic views of the Gloucestershire countryside. Swings and roundabouts. As we mentioned, he was, a, he was known as being a bit of a mama's boy and this was very much underlined by the fact that his mum would actually arrive at his school to have a go at his teachers for yelling at her favourite son. This just made Fred the butt of many jokes from his um, peers and then he would eventually drop out of school at the age of 15 to become a farm labourer. And as we said, the, he's very much a mama's boy. His father, quite the opposite, had a strong dislike for Fred in particular and spent all of his time and affection on Fred's other brothers. The West children were expected to basically work on the farm and all six of them did kind of seasonal work. So the girls would pick strawberries and the boys would harvest wheat and honey hunt rabbits and basically that helped keep food on the table and kept money coming into the family but it was very much instilling a strong work ethic on young Fred and again we'd see that kind of continue throughout his formative years and later life. He would also whilst working on the farm and kind of hanging out in the in the village of Muchmarkle develop a slight taste for petty crime. So Fred and his friends would burgle houses and steal from shops. They would also vandalise cars and houses in the local area. And this would lead to him being arrested several times, though from what we could find, the most serious punishment during his early years was a £4 fine. So at school, when he when he did attend, classmates recalled Fred as scruffy, lethargic, dim and regularly in trouble. Um, and as Tom mentioned, when he did get in trouble, his mother would actually go down and tell teachers off for shouting at him. However, he would leave school at the age of 15, starting to work as a labourer on Moorcourt Farm. So an interesting uh, theme continues here and when Fred is 16, him and his brother John frequently attended a youth club in a nearby town of Ledbury where his distinct accent marked him as a country bumpkin and he would aggressively pester uh, young girls and women who he basically saw as objects at the time and kind of approached it a similar way to I guess how his his mother would approach him. So yeah, he he was a decent looking guy at the time. He was regarded as one of the better looking boys boys in town but he, he didn't have too much luck with with the ladies in his teenage years so when he was 17 years old he 
actually had a motorbike accident, which um, left him in a coma for a week with serious head injuries. And it seems to be a very common uh, case in, in all the ones we've discussed, especially mm-hmm. leaving the last week's case. But this accident and the, and the impact of the head really did impact um, Fred with the way he acted. His brother would actually say he never was quite the same. They had to place a metal plate in his head and this affected the behaviour and his impulse control. Yeah, and it was a sound like a bad accident. I mean, he was riding his motorbike on a on a country road and collided with a young girl called Pat who was on her push bike. Fred ended up with a fractured skull, a broken arm, as well as a broken leg. So yeah, he he, uh, he came off really really badly from that accident. Whereas Pat escaped with minor injuries. So this isn't the only accident that Fred would have that would be a head injury. He also suffered a fall from the uh, the fire escape of a local youth club, which was again a very severe head injury and could possibly left him with permanent brain damage. Damage. We keep saying it every week in terms of obviously trauma to the head, it can definitely change the way someone's um, yeah, impulses are or the empathy or lack thereof. As we go on with this, it seems quite key that that, yeah. that definitely happened. And that, that fall from the fire escape at the local youth club was because he uh, he was out on the fire escape with a, with a young lady, grabbed her inappropriately, she slapped him and that caused him to fall. After these particular run of injuries uh, to the head, as well as his uh, own mental health, it also had a profound impact on his personal life because it did impact his physical appearance. Apparently it made some of his features slightly crooked, one leg shorter than the other and walked with a limp. And as you said, before the accident, there's photos of him on, on this motorbike with, I guess, some of it looks like some of his sisters, perhaps. And he's, he's not a bad looking guy during his early years, but you go on to see these very famous images of him. And it's, yeah, quite a, quite a contrast. In 1961, Fred was accused of impregnating a 13 year old girl. Now, we found some conflicting information about this. Some some um, some reports say it was the uh, a friend of the family. But other reports say it was actually his sister, Kitty, who was 13 years old. Either way, this resulted with him being kicked out of the family home. And at the trial, he escaped a jail sentence because he was claiming that he was suffering from fits from the head trauma that he had already suffered. But he was convicted of child molestation. Yeah, there's a really poignant moment here where Fred is kind of a pro- like basically if it was his sister Kitty then she'd come out to say that Fred had been raping her since the previous year when police then question him about this now whether it's Kitty or whether it's a, a family friend Fred turns around and, and admits it freely but goes doesn't everybody do this so he's already got in his head and the way he's been kind of raised that this is a completely normal act but the rest of the family kind of out- outcast him from this the parents knowing that it was wrong, a wrong the wrong thing to do and maybe knowing if, there's a, if that's public that they could get in trouble as well. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very messed up um, childhood there. Fred's sister refused to testify against him and his mother was prepared to testify in his defence. So the case collapsed. Yeah, so basically the rest of the family kind of abandon uh, and disown Fred apart from his parents. Well, I guess apart from mainly the mother, but apparently his parents stuck by him throughout this the initial stage of this trial but like we said earlier with with his dad like apparently being you know uh, as well uh, performing incestuous acts fred claimed later on that his father had the logic of i made you so i'm entitled to have you which is a horrible quote to say so soon after that he became a construction worker but was soon caught stealing from his employers and having sex with minors again so yeah but yeah this kind of then getting into the building side of things which obviously will come into play later yeah. on in this case uh, it seems like fred's someone who's very good with his hands and quite like so Fred would go on to meet a 16-year-old called Catherine Bernadette Costello, who's nicknamed um, Rena. And Rena as well, she had a bit of trouble with the police. So Rena had a, a record for burglary as well as uh, being a sex worker. So Rena was actually pregnant by the time Fred met her with a bus driver. And apparently this made her fall out of her parents. Sorry. And... I'm imagining she's got a bus driver in her belly, the way that's said. So when Fred met Rena at the time, she was pregnant by a local uh, bus driver who was Asian, which her parents didn't, were not too happy with. And basically that kind of made her kind of distance herself from her parents. So I think at the time, obviously, they both were, they'd both come out of kind of hostile situations. They saw a lot of themselves in each other. So they would actually go on to secretly marry in November of that year. And they moved immediately to Glasgow, Scotland. Fred very much wanted to get away from much Markle. Fred basically viewing this as kind of a clean slate and a, and a fresh start to get away uh, from much Markle. And now we're going to take a look at Rose's childhood. So Rosemary Letts. Okay, Rose was born in Devon on November 29th, 1953 to William Andrew Letts and Daisy Gwendoline Fuller. Apparently this was a very difficult pregnancy. Uh, both parents were suffering with mental illness and actually whilst um, her mother was pregnant with her, she would go through electric convulsive therapy. You can only imagine if... 
you're told not to smoke or drink when you're pregnant, mm. that is going to be something that's going to be very damaging. Um, and this may have caused prenatal injury that contributed to Rose's poor school performance and bouts of aggression growing up. And apparently the last time that her mother received the uh, the last ECT was just days before Rose was born. That's not good. No. Um, you do, you're doctor. Absolutely. You can't imagine that would have been any good for, uh, for, for Rose just days before she was born. So when Rose was taken home from the hospital, a beautiful new baby, uh, people would um, notice some strange behaviour. She apparently would rock her head for hours and apparently she would r- rhythmically bash her head against the cot at night. God. So yeah, some, some strange behaviour there from, from a very young stage. And uh, Rose herself would grow up in a very abusive household. Uh, Sexual abuse was rife, particularly from her father. Um, She would also perform uh, fairly poorly at school, um, which actually resulted in other school children picking on her. And they actually called her Dozy Rosie. Kids can be so cruel. My mind just went mad then with kind of rhymes for you, but then I didn't do any of them. Uh, But apparently Rose... Please. Fart a car? Yeah. Bend over. What? Ben. Dover, that was a common one. What does that mean? Just because my name's Ben. But what does it mean? I don't know at the time. That's what I used to get at school. All right, Ben Dover. It's horrible. Did Kids are cruel. Sorry? Did you do it? No. I won't, I won't fall in for that. So a little bit more on Rose's father. He was a paranoid schizophrenic and he was a war veteran. So he's prone to violent behaviour. Apparently he was a very, yeah, very controlling person in the household, like similar to Fred's. And rather than... Um, beat Rose, he would um, sexually abuse her instead, which apparently this would lead to her escaping the beatings. She didn't see anything wrong within it. She thought it was, yeah. a, it was a way of him showing love to her, uh, which is very disturbing. Yeah, and just on that, it was widely alleged that that kind of instilled, like you say, the the, the belief that this is normal behaviour uh, and, a, and a, had a thing to do as an act of, of affection or love on someone. So she would also apparently, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, molest her younger brother. So sexualization within the family was very much normalised and uh, yeah just not a very happy home life as a teenager apparently Rose would, would walk around like naked around the house regularly and she would eat, start dating boys a lot older than her age and yeah she's getting very quite promiscuous with older men maybe just because she saw that with her father you know she linked and thought that was all uh, all normal eventually her mother Daisy would move out of the family home taking Rose with her but Rose however decided to move back in with her father again so with Fred and Rena living in Glasgow to, with one another they would um, have a very they would have stages where they wouldn't be living with one another and kind of distance themselves and come back to one another. It's very abusive. Rena would often call old friends or old lovers to come and save her from Fred with how he was acting. And in Glasgow, Fred was actually employed as a local ice cream company driver. Yes, yeah, so lots of interest in Fred West, Scotland stories. But apparently there was a particular moment where he would often abuse Rena. But any time any of Rena's male friends were there, he would never fight back when attacked or, you know, provoked by any of her male friends he very much saw it as okay to physically assault women but he, he was very much the opposite when it came to p- perhaps fighting with men one particularly grim part that i read is that um with the two children the two young girls that uh rena had when fred would kind of come and go between the property he would put the girls in the lower part of a bunk bed and then board up just kind of imprison them within the bunk bed and that could be up for days at a time as well which is just absolutely horrible and neighbors would often overhear the girls uh, screaming and shouting for help but fred would always find it very easy to abuse children and women but at yeah. any time any time any of rena's male companions fought him or struck him he would never fight back so those two daughters were charmaine who was rena who she was already pregnant with when she met fred and Anne marie who she actually had with fred and now we're going to go into the fred and rose west timeline So in 1967, Fred West, during one of the periods of estrangement from his first wife, Rena, struck up a relationship with Anne McFool, his 16-year-old nanny who took care of his daughter, Anne Marie, and stepdaughter, Charmaine. Described by Fred as the love of his life and his angel, a couple years after striking up this initial relationship with her, she's 18 at the time when she falls pregnant with his child, Um, and apparently at this point she urges Fred to leave Rena and start a new life with her her so this is very much fred's perspective here but apparently you know he's got himself in another position where he's he's with multiple uh, partners uh, multiple children as well and yeah he's, he's um he's also being unfaithful to rena may 1967 Anne vanished before giving birth to a baby she was thought to be around six months pregnant at this point fred unwilling to leave his family for her killed Anne and buried her near the caravan park 
curtain off her fingers and toes. After Anne's disappearance, Rena returned to the family home. So Rena and Fred did move around quite a bit and they often frequented this, this caravan park. But they cut off the fingers and toes. Mm. Some people believe it's, it's just obviously the fingerprints and whatnot. And it's, this is one way of hiding the identity of the person. Mm. But it would be something that would carry on throughout. Yeah, others would argue that this was, you know, something he would do while they're still alive as well to torture them. So Fred was also linked to another disappearance that happened within six months of Anne McFall's death, and that was a 15-year-old Mary Bastholm, who was abducted from a bus stop in Gloucester in January 1968. She was last seen wearing a blue jacket with a blue and white dress and was carrying a blue bag. There's only circumstantial evidence which has ever been produced to corroborate this. So this period of time is very interesting because he's uh, apparently he would go, you know, disappear for days. So would Rena. But apparently while he uh, was in Scotland, he also owned an allotment um, which he used to grow potatoes and cabbages of, of all things. That is interesting. Yeah. However, a portion of this allotment remained clear and raked, ready for planting. When other allotment owners would ask Fred, what are you, you know, what are your plans here? That's a nice bit of land. What are you doing there? Fred apparently would go, oh, it's for something special. Multiple people would say that he would go to his allotment many times at night for sex with with younger girls during this period of time as well four young girls went missing and were never found again the area was later bulldozed and is now actually part of a 13 lane motorway uh, making up the m8 so they're never able to actually excavate the area and investigate it properly but there's just with with fred west you'll find we'll talk about the many uh, the many victims that have been proven but there's also many many that still remain you know, unsolved and, uh, and are continuing to be investigated today. So also between that time, like, like Ben said, uh, Rena and Fred would leave each other many times during that. And this resulted in the children being placed in and out of care. So uh, Rena was always returning and leaving within a few days due to the physical abuse at the hands of Fred. So November of 1968, this is where the paths of Fred and Rose uh, finally meet. And it could be argued that this is one of the most fatal meetings in British history. So whilst still married to his previous wife, then 27-year-old Fred West met Rosemary Letts shortly after her 15th birthday at a bus station in Cheltenham. Initially, Rose was repulsed by Fred's appearance, thinking that he was homeless. However, she quickly became flattered by the attention he continued to show her over the following days as he took every opportunity to sit alongside her at the same bus stop, which I think is just creepy. It is very creepy. Over the course of a few days, Rose twice refused to go on a date with Fred, but allowed him to accompany her home. So Fred quickly discovered that Rose worked in a nearby bread shop, aka a bakery. <laughs> Fred quickly discovered that Rose worked in a nearby bakery, persuading an unknown woman to go into the shop and to tell her that a man outside had asked to present this gift to her. Minutes later, Fred entered and asked Rose to accompany him on a date that evening, which she accepted. So apparently Rose's father, like we mentioned, was very controlling and she wasn't happy at all about this relationship that was happening between Fred and Rose. So this bread shop gift as well is alleged to have been a jacket and dress that actually belonged to Rena. In August of 1969, Rose's parents forbade their daughter from continuing to date Fred, but she continued anyway. They contacted social services to say that their 15-year-old daughter was dating an older man, obviously at this point, He's, he's almost double her age and that they had heard rumors that she had began to engage in sex work at his caravan social services would go on to place rose in a home for troubled teenagers in cheltenham and when allowed to return home to visit her parents at weekends rose took the opportunity to instead visit fred so in november 1969 not long after her 16th birthday rose left the home and moved in with fred at lake house caravan site near cheltenham where fred was currently living with his daughters charmaine and Anne marie in july of 1970 uh, the couple moved from the caravan to a two-story house which was number 25 Midland Road, Gloucester. On the 17th of October 1970, Rose gave birth to the pair's first daughter, Heather Ann. And on the 4th of December 1970, Fred West was imprisoned for theft and remained there until his release on the 24th of June 1971. So just months after becoming a father for the second time, uh, Fred is back behind bars. So June 1971, Rose would kill Charmaine shortly before West's release. Charmaine was uh, Fred's stepdaughter. Um, his um, wife, Rena, was pregnant before they got together. According to Anne-Marie, both sisters were frequently physically abused, but Charmaine infuriated Rose by refusing to cry. On one occasion, a neighbour came into the house to see Charmaine standing on a chair, naked, with her arms tied with a belt, and Rose attacking her with a rolling pin. 
When Charmaine disappeared, Rosemary explained that Rena, Fred's estranged wife, had called and taken her back to Scotland, telling Anne-Marie she had gone to live with her mother and bloody good riddance, when in fact Rose had murdered her. Several finger bones were removed as keepsakes, and when Fred came home, he buried Charmaine under the kitchen floor, encasing her in concrete. Quick question. This neighbour that's walked in, why are they not reporting that? Yeah. That's it's insane, a, isn't it? It's a very insane. Uh, that's... That's crazy, isn't it? Uh, that's, mm. that's, uh, oh, I'm, I'm. So in late August, Rena turned up to collect Charmaine and then she also disappeared. Her questions about where Charmaine was led to Fred strangling her to avoid any investigation into the whereabouts of Charmaine. It's also been suggested that Rena was subjected to sexual abuse before her death because she was buried bound with a short length of metal tubing. Fred then dismembered Rena, placed her into plastic bags and buried her close to a cluster of trees known as Yew Tree Coppice, near to Fred's childhood home in much Markle, Herefordshire. I think Rose would have been very happy to see Rena out of the picture. Oh, absolutely. And Rena perhaps already aware of kind of Fred's background and what he's capable of she's a big problem when she turns up and her and her and her biological daughter's missing yeah she's gonna put two and two together pretty quick and uh yeah rose very happy so 29th of january 1972 fred and rose west married at the registry office in gloucester rose being just 18 at the time on the marriage certificate fred declared himself as a bachelor despite still being married to rena as she had not yet been declared dead no family or friends were invited apart from fred's brother john who acted as best man and witness at this point rose was already pregnant with their second child so fred quickly quickly moving on a few months later the family moved into the infamous 25 cromwell street initially through renting it from the council fred later bought the three-story house complete with basement for seven thousand pounds the wests converted the upstairs rooms into bed sits and added a cooker and sink to the first floor so that future lodgers would not need to use the ground floor maintaining an element of privacy for the family lodgers were also not allowed to use the garden so just to kind of highlight something there rose being 18 she'd already committed a murder yeah, already having two children at that stage. You can't help but say that she was part of Rena's tragic end as well. So the 1st of June 1972, Rose gave birth to their second daughter, May. It was around this time Fred encouraged his wife into sex work. Um, she advertised her services in a local magazine. Rose's room was a dedicated room Fred created for this. Used for sex work, it had peepholes so he could watch and a red light outside the door to warn the children not to enter. Um, Rose's father, Bill Letts, with Fred's approval, would often visit their home to have sex with Rose. She also began having casual sex with both male and female lodgers, often claiming that no man or woman could satisfy her. Rose's sexual relations with women gradually became more and more violent, gaining excitement from the fear they showed when she would beat them or insert large sex toys into them. Fred and Rose would also engage in threesomes with Rose's lovers. As well to cater to various fetishes, they collected a large number of bondage and restraining devices, magazines and photographs, expanding this collection to include videos depicting bestiality and graphic child sexual abuse. Rose eventually had eight children, of which which three were fathered by her clients. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, some, there's always something going on in this this case, and it just gradually gets darker and darker. But one of the one of the ITV documentaries I watched was basically based around one uh, Fred's brother. He had alleged that basically a lot of Rose's regular clients, as well as being family members, were also uh, police officers, and that's why whenever some people would kind of report um, potential crimes that the Wests were committing, or even noise complaints, because there was often loud music playing because so many were involved and in, in active clients of rose they would just kind of turn a blind eye to it which is just yeah rose's light is red and police wear blue what are you gonna do i was better in my head roses are red police wear blue go on go on October 1972, the Wests hired a 17-year-old nanny for the children called Caroline Roberts. They picked her up whilst she was hitchhiking, enlisting her services as well as providing her a place to stay. Whilst working as their nanny, Fred and Rose invited Caroline to join their sex circle, which she rejected, leaving a few weeks later. A few weeks later, on the 6th of December 1972, the Wests picked Caroline up again whilst she was hitchhiking. They restrained her, tortured her and raped her but allowed her to leave the next day, only after she promised she would return as their nanny. Caroline then reported the rape to police but withdrew the accusation when the case came to court. The Wests pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of indecent assault and were fined £50. So they've admitted the assault. Uh, yeah, but I mean, she obviously she withdrew the accusation so they were able to get a lesser 
you know, lesser penalty there, which we'll, we'll go into it later on, but Caroline would live to kind of regret that decision. In early 1973, the Wests start to take eight-year-old Anne-Marie, Fred's daughter from his first marriage, to the cellar, where she was bound, gagged and raped by Fred as Rose watched on. This would continue for years. Lodges of 25 Cromwell Street have described instances of hearing her screaming. Yeah, so there's a person, an account from a guy called Gil Britt, who was a lodger, um, recalls a time when um, a 13-year-old Anne knocked on the door and showed bruises that she'd been inflicted. Um, he'd gone to say where these bruises were on Anne, she pulled down her blouse from the top where the line of her bra would be. She had black bruises all over her bra line, on her chest and on her breasts. But again, it's like, if that was there, why aren't you reporting that? Maybe they are, maybe the police are turning a blind, a blind eye, maybe they yeah. know what's going on, but should we call on one of the, the Gloucestershire facts? Dan, Gloucestershire fact, you want that? I'm up for it. Let's do it. Let's do it then. Hopefully it's light. Hopefully it's light. Hopefully it's interesting. Hopefully oh. it's interesting. Roll yeah, the dice. Otherwise, it's the only time we'll do it. Okay, Gloucester fact number one. The biggest ice cream factory in the UK is the Walls Factory, which is based in Gloucester. Okay, back to the case. Right. Yeah. Got better ones than that. Nah, you, you, had a, you had a chance there. Got a real moment. All right, do one more quickly. Okay. These days, Gloucester rugby fans are known as the Cherry and Whites, but they were once nicknamed the Elver Eaters, a reference to the locals' fondness for eating eels. The US National Anthem is set to a tune written by Gloucester-born John Stafford Smith, a composer buried in Gloucester Cathedral. The 19th of April, 1973. <laughs> but yeah, we'll go back to the case. Thank you, Ben. No problem. 19th of April, 1973. Linda Goff went missing just before her 20th birthday. She was a seamstress who attended a private school. It is thought that Fred and Rose abducted her and raped her. Linda's jaw was wrapped in surgical tape used to silence her screams. Tubes were inserted into her mouth to allow her to breathe through her torture before strangling and suffocating Linda to death. She was then dismembered, various fingers were removed and buried in a pit beneath the couple's garage in 25 Cromwell Street. November 1973. Carol Ann Cooper, aged 15, went missing. Carol Ann had been living at a children's home as her mother had died when she was very young, but was allowed out to visit her grandmother. She was last seen boarding a bus by her boyfriend after seeing a movie with him. She was likely kidnapped from the bus stop, dragged into Fred's car, bound with tape and taken to Cromwell Street. Once inside the house, Carol Ann was suspended from the ceiling in the cellar where she was raped and abused before being strangled to death. Fred then dismembered her, also removing several of her fingers and buried her in the cellar. Her grandmother reported her missing at the time, but the police had no luck finding her. The 27th of December 1973, Lucy Partington was a 21-year-old Exeter University student who had come home for Christmas. She was on the way home from visiting friends and had left her friend's house in a rush to get the last bus from Cheltenham to Gretton. She was most likely abducted by Fred and Rose whilst at the bus stop. It is thought she was kept alive and tortured for several days in the cellar, with Fred injuring himself as he dismembered her body, as Fred went to casualty with a serious cut in his right hand in the early hours of the 3rd of January 1974. Lucy was buried in the cellar with the, with the masking tape used to gag her still around her mouth. The knife used to cut up her body was buried alongside her. April 1974. Therese Siegenfaller was a 21 year old student from Switzerland who came to England in late 1972. She studied at Woolwich College of Further Education in London. Therese left her accommodation in Lewisham on April 15, 1974, to travel to Ireland but never reached her destination. She had told friends that she had planned to hitchhike to reach Ireland, and it is very likely that she was abducted by Fred and Rose whilst doing this. After being tortured like the other victims, Therese was gagged with a scarf which was tied in a bow. Once they had killed her and buried her in the cellar, bow still intact, Fred built a fake chimney breast over her grave. As she had been due back in England the week after Easter, Therese was reported missing. The Metropolitan Police carried out an investigation that lasted for multiple years but had no success. November 1974, Shelley Hubbard, a 15-year-old who was on her work experience in Debenhams, was abducted from a bus stop by Fred and Rose. She was last seen leaving the Worcester Debenhams by colleagues. Again, Fred and Rose used brutal torture techniques on the young girl, wrapping her from head to toe in tape, but inserting a tube into her nose as she was able to breathe throughout the ordeal. When she was finally killed and buried in the cellar, the wall above her was decorated with wallpaper bearing Marilyn Monroe's image along with the names of some of the star's movies, one of which was the 1956 film Bus Stop. 1975, Juanita Mott had lodged for some time at 25 Cromwell Street and managed to escape alive. 
She was living with a friend in Newant when she disappeared, likely being abducted by Fred and Rose whilst hitchhiking. She too was hung from the ceiling, brutally tortured and murdered and then buried in the cellar after being dismembered. So you have to wonder there, she used to lodge there, maybe they were worried what she'd seen or what she'd heard and the fact that she kind of left there maybe without talking to them before going. Maybe they were, you know, very conscious of trying to keep her quiet. Once they disposed of Twinita's body, um, they concreted the floor and the room was then turned into a bedroom for the West's children. It's which is, thought, is yeah. very haunting. In 1977, Shirley Robinson, an 18-year-old lodger, had begun a sexual relationship with Fred. After falling pregnant with his child, it has been suggested that she posed a threat to the rest's relationship. Fred persuaded her to sell her baby to a childless couple and had taken pictures of Shirley to send to them. However, Shirley didn't get to the birth. Whilst heavily pregnant, she was killed by the couple. Running out of space in their cellar, the Wests buried Shirley and a dead fetus which had been cut out of a body in their back garden. They told people who asked that Shirley had moved to Scotland. August 1979, Alison Chambers had been living with the Wests as a live-in nanny for several weeks. She was born in Hanover, but had lived in Swansea for much of her life. She moved to Gloucestershire at the age of 16 to work at a solicitor's firm. Whilst living with the West, she was also restrained, bound and gagged in creative ways. And when she was killed, she still had a leather belt looped beneath her jaw and fastened to the top of her skull. She was also dismembered and buried in their garden. In 1979, throughout these murders, Anne-Marie had been continuously raped and abused by the Wests. She had been forced to perform household chores while wearing sexual devices and a miniskirt. She was raped more than 300 times, also allegedly by her uncle John West. She was given syphilis by her dad and forced to work as a sex worker in the house at 13, often interrupted by clients while she was doing homework. Anne-Marie eventually became pregnant by Fred, but the pregnancy was terminated as it was ectopic. So that is basically when the baby starts growing outside of the womb and it can, and it can become fatal to the mother and the child. On her return home, she was savagely beaten by Rose. Unable to cope with her father and stepmother any longer, she left home. So that we've we've obviously what is this now episode this is like a 28th episode yep that paragraph might be the worst I've ever heard their own kid raped for over 300 times given a sexually transmitted disease made to wear um, mini skirts whilst doing household chores yep Multiple family members sexually abusing her. That's absolutely disgusting. The eight West children were taken to hospital 31 times in 20 years. Obviously, one of them had a sexually transmitted disease. Others had significant injuries that should have rang child protection alarm bells. I think they had bleeding genitals, broken bones, gloved fingers where, you, you know, the finger comes away from the bone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've heard cases before where the kind of keeping track of families, keeping track of crimes, keeping track of any kind of records have been very dicey and they're kind of like, luckily nowadays people are able to keep them, well, most of the time can keep a firmer eye on this. But yeah, it's definitely something that you would hope would be flagged up. So when Anne-Marie ran away, age 15, Fred turned his attention to his and Rose's eldest biological children, Heather and May. He molested both of them and threatened to break them in. While May developed a coping mechanism of laughing off the abuse and rape, Heather was so disturbed that she started drinking and became withdrawn socially. She started, she started acting up in school and distancing herself from classmates. The West's parents thought Heather's behaviour suggested that she was gay and they would taunt her endlessly. She refused to shower at school but when forced, classmates noticed that her arms, legs and body were covered in bruises. This continued for many years. So another former lodger, Jane Hamer, only 17 herself when she lived at the Wests, said that she often heard disturbing noises from the cellar, once hearing Heather screaming, stop it daddy. Jane said that one night Heather asked to speak to her, saying that she told me Fred was breaking his young daughter in as all good dads should. Then she told me to get out of here while you still can. Thankfully, she saved my life. So there, you know, I... I I understand that they were keeping the, you know, they had separate entrances for upstairs and downstairs. They wanted to keep the family very much clear of the lodgers mm. and what was going on in Rose's room. But there you go, Heather's gone out of her way to speak to one of the lodgers. And despite the hell that she was living in, she's perhaps saved a life there. Well, she has saved a life there. June 1987, after leaving school at 16, Heather hoped for an escape through gaining a cleaning job at Butlin's holiday camp in Torquay. However, she was rejected. When she found out, she cried through the night 
The next day, her siblings went to school as normal, and when they returned home, she was gone. Heather's sister May would go on to say, the night before she went, she was very upset. She had got a job as a chalet cleaner at a holiday camp in Torquay and was really looking forward to it. But that night, for some reason, the job was cancelled. Heather went to bed sobbing and cried throughout all of the night. I had never seen her like that before. You couldn't have cuddled her. She just wasn't that sort of person. On the 19th of June, a neighbour reported hearing raised voices within the house, which Rose dismissed as being one hell of a row. This is likely when Heather was killed. She was stripped naked and probably raped before her death. She was tied up with two lengths of rope, 22 and 15 inches long. Fred finally strangled Heather, killing her and shoved her remains in, in the wheelie bin behind the Wendy house until he had time to bury her. Fred and Rose made up various stories when faced with questions about Heather's whereabouts. They told concerned school friends and their parents that she had run away, that she was a drug dealer, that she had called them and that they had called the police, none of which were true. They often held family barbecues over the spot where she was buried. Both of them, Fred and Rose, have always got an answer for everything. Um, people that abuse children regularly apparently can very quickly have a pre-prepared notion or cover story. And they have, they do, they have... And it, and it does line up as well. Like that she was applying for a role in, in Torquay that would have made sense to the rest of the siblings yeah. and family. So. so one of the suggestions here is that apparently they waited until she left school before killing her just because then people wouldn't notice that she was missing as much as if she wasn't going to school anymore because apparently she had threatened to go to the police to try and protect her siblings from the abuse. May 1992, Wes filmed himself raping one of his other daughters and twice again afterwards. His daughter Louise told friends at school what had happened. On the 4th of August 1992, her friend's mother contacted the police. This also forced police to begin investigation into Heather's mysterious disappearance. So on the 6th of August 1992, the police begin their investigation into the sexual abuse of the West children, leading to Fred being charged with rape and Rose as an accomplice. She was also charged with child cruelty and inciting her husband to engage in sex with their daughter. The remaining children were placed into foster care, the police continued investigating the disappearance of their daughter, Heather. After finding out that Fred had denied any wrongdoing, Anne-Marie also contacted police, giving a full statement detailing her experiences as a child. Anne-Marie also added she had, for several years, been unsuccessfully attempting to trace her mother, Rena, and half-sisters, Charmaine and Heather. So the evidence is, is starting to build up here. 11th of August, 1993. On questioning, Rose claimed that she could remember now that her daughter Heather had left home due to Rose's concerns her other children may discover Heather's lesbian inclinations. Rose then added she had also given her daughter £600 to make her leave the household and claimed she had multiple phone conversations with her daughter over the years. On the 7th of June 1993, the rape case against the West collapsed when Louise declined to testify at the court case and stated that she wanted to return to her family. Anne-Marie also withdrew her statement out of concern for her family and the vindictiveness of Rose. When, when I also found this bit of information out, it's a massive lapse. In, like This could be, like you said, um, about the policeman. This could be done on purpose. But during the police investigation, an immense quantity of pornographic material, including 99 homemade videos, were found at Cromwell Street. The police destroyed the videos, apparently without ever watching them, which they may well have contained murders or videos of the victims in. For what reason would they destroy them? Just, that's... I don't know. I mean, like... I don't, yeah, I do not know. So as well as that, both children kind of backing down to, you know, save their parents from being prosecuted as well. You can't help but think maybe... I don't think it was to save them, though. It was, it was, I think they've probably been worried the fact that over time, uh, they're worried about the vindictiveness of Rose. So both children have kind of withdrawn their accusations based on their fear? Yeah, I think fear, yeah. For retaliation, which is, which is absolutely hideous. So the 24th of February 1994, whilst the children were in foster care, they had told social workers about a family joke that Heather was buried under the patio. Police then obtained a search warrant for 25 Cromwell Street after taking statements from the social workers. So this was kind of a throwaway joke, like, if you keep misbehaving, we'll put you with Heather and yeah. underneath the patio. Yeah. Don't sit too close to that TV, your eyes will go square. And Heather's under the patio. Uh, if the wind changes, your face will stay like that. But then no one's going to the police. Like a saying. I'd got the saying did bit. Get, did you get it? Yeah, same just, same just didn't really relate to the case yeah that's um, the thing about fred and rose um yeah um but carry on ben sorry sorry about that 
The police checked with Anne-Marie, who confirmed that she had also heard her father tell this joke and that he burst into fits of laughter, which is why she didn't take the comment seriously. Looking further into Fred, they also noticed that no missing persons report had been submitted for his wife, Rena, or his daughter, Charmaine. This warrant allowed them to excavate the garden in search of Heather. I don't think he ever thinks about the repercussions of his actions, does he? It's just a case of getting things done, blagging his way through life. When they showed the warrant to Rose, she became distraught, abusive and contradictory when questioned again about their daughter's disappearance. Fred was working in Stroud during this time. On hearing from his son Stephen, he travelled home. He told his family that he would go to the police to give a voluntary witness statement, in which he again claimed that Heather had run away with a drugs cartel and that the children were talking rubbish. The police left the house that evening, but left the guard for the garden. Early the next morning, Fred said to his son, Look son, look after mum and sell the house. I've done something really bad. I want you to go to the papers and make as much money as you can. Police returned shortly after. Fred then stated his intentions to provide a full confession for Heather's murder. He was then formally cautioned and arrested. He admitted to strangling Heather in a fit of rage, and he denied any involvement of Rose in this crime. He then volunteered to accompany police to the house to pinpoint the precise location of Heather's body. So Fred apparently would say, all I was going to do is grab her around the neck and shake her. When he was saying about why, you know, why he killed her. So he's trying to claim the fact that it was an accident. So on the 26th of February 1994, police began excavating the section of garden at Cromwell Street where Fred indicated he had buried his daughter's body. After 4pm, police also found a human thigh bone protruding from a section of the garden Fred had insisted police need not look in. Investigators eventually discovered a mass of jumbled human remains in the remains of a bin bag intertwined with two lengths of rope. Yeah, so with this, the police apparently said to Fred, there's another body here unless Heather had three legs. Yeah, dark, Um, dark, dark sense of humour. These dismembered remains were taken to the police headquarters for further examination, where they were determined to be those of a young woman. Fingernails were also discovered in a pile, suggesting they may have been torn from her fingers as a means of torture. Several hours later, the body was identified by dental records as being that of Heather West. Fred was formally charged later that evening. He was also questioned about the third thigh bone found in the garden, leading him to confess to the murder of Shirley Robinson, and incorrectly, Shirley's mate. Uh, this is according to uh, according to Fred. It was just a friend of Shirley's who happened to be there. He was also charged with these murders. Fred confided to his appropriate adult, Janet Leach, that Rose murdered Shirley Robinson and had assisted in her dismemberment, personally removing Robinson's fetus from the womb in the process. Well, it's essentially appropriate adult. So if, if someone, if an adult is taken into the police station and they're thought to maybe not be... Um to lack mental capacity. Yeah, lack the mental capacity to understand and deal with the situation. There will be a sign someone who is an appropriate adult. There's actually a TV series called Appropriate Adult, which is all based around this case, which is very, very good, and I highly recommend you watch it. Fred would uh, go on to be questioned further for up to 16 hours per day for multiple days, predominantly about the disappearance of his wife, Rena, and daughter, Charmaine. 4th of March 1994, Thread authorised his solicitor to pass a note he had written to the leader of the murder investigation. This note read, I, Frederick West, authorise my solicitor, Howard Ogden, to advise Superintendent Bennett that I wish to admit a further approximately nine killings, expressly Charmaine, Rena, Linda Goff and others to be identified, F. West. The whole house was then evacuated and Rose and the children were moved to a safe house, leading to the discovery of five further bodies in the cellar. Some of the bodies' limbs and fingers were missing, but Fred refused to divulge the whereabouts of the bones missing or the reason for their absence. So during this formal questioning, Fred confessed to murdering up to 30 other people, which basically would indicate there's 18 other undiscovered victims. There, yeah, there's there's audio of an interrogation of Fred West and he basically goes on to say you're getting it all wrong about the murders they weren't murders it was enjoyment turned disaster not murder yeah see you even got the killing wrong you, you, you're trying to make out I just went out and blatantly killed somebody no nobody went to hell enjoyment turned to disaster that's what happened on all of it, or most of it anyway what rose around me at work in the mid, uh, midday, middle of the day, um, and said the police were digging the garden up. Come home quick. So anyway, I got home. But anyway, Asian Savage come, and um, I went down to the police station. I mean, I had nothing to bloody hide. When I walked in here and I sat down there, I could feel my head like lifting up, and I was going, 
sort of into space. And I could see diggers and everything all plowing around and ripping out something, tearing the floorboards up and bulldozing the house down. It was all weird and I couldn't. But I could see it all in my mind and everything was gone wrong. I mean, I, I don't know what, I can't, I've been, we've been trying, I've been trying to explain that, the feeling, what happened. I don't know if it was a pill or something. That's the only thing I can think it was. Like, I'd done nothing else. 20th of April 1994, Rose was arrested initially on offences relating to the rape of an 11-year-old girl and the physical assault of an 8-year-old boy, both charges dating from the mid-1970s. The following day, she was refused bail. She was questioned more closely about the murders, in particular those of daughter Heather and Linda Goff. On 25th of April 1994, Rose was formally charged with Linda Goff's murder. So on the 30th of June 1994, Fred and Rose West were brought before a magistrate's court in Gloucester. Fred was charged with 11 murders and Rose was charged with 10. This was the first time they had seen each other since their arrest, so there'd been a four-month period where they weren't in contact. Prior to hearing the formal charges against them, Fred leaned towards his wife and gently placed his hand upon her shoulder. Surprisingly, Rose, having ignored her husband's presence, visibly winced in discomfort. As police attempted to lead Fred from the hearing, he resisted their efforts and again attempted to move towards Rose, who again winced and attempted to writhe away from him. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, conjecture here in terms of what people think. Uh, the thought initially was uh, Fred was going to take the fall completely for for um, you know all these murders, but then once he was doing that and Rose was giving him like no attention and completely writing him off as you know a human, he would then kind of became bitter and it's thought that this you know the way she acted with him in the courtroom actually started making fred go you know what i'm gonna just tell her what she did as well she's she's just as much to blame as i am it's kind of similarities between kind of uh ian brady and myra yeah. Haley here i think he was expecting her to be all kind of lovey-dovey with him haven't seen you in a while but she was the complete opposite and i think she was probably trying to act that way to distance herself totally from, yeah from any potential yeah. charges i mean that's the thing with this it's like fred in some in some cases had to kind of you know trying to cover the tracks of things that Rose had done in an act of rage when he came back from being in prison and he was trying to cover her tracks. A lot of people would go on to say that Rose was actually the leader here and mm -hmm. she was the one that was kind of leading the kind of, yeah, the uh, horrible um, scenes that were going to happen. And the 3rd of July 1994, Alan McFall's body was found. Fred was re-arrested on suspicion of murder. That evening he was officially charged. So during this time when Fred was in prison, he was placed on suicide watch and this apparently was due to uh, Rose's refusal to reply to the letters he had sent her. And apparently Rose has started playing that role of a grief mother who had lost a daughter, stepdaughter to her husband and she kept you know claiming her innocence here and also how much she hated him. So Fred would then go on like I mentioned withdrew his earlier confessions to saying he had acted alone and instead accused his wife of, of, the, of almost total culpability. It seems that Fred couldn't deal with the fact the fact that she was currently writing him off. Yeah he was willing to fall on the sword for her but not after. But she wasn't looking at the sword she's like nah. Yeah. Ooh get that sword away from me. Oh, it was Oh. She wasn't speaking to him either though, actually. No. So they probably just said it with the with the eyes. On the 1st of January 1995, Fred's suicide watch had been relaxed. He then goes on to hang himself in his prison cell by wrapping an improvised rope he had constructed from a blanket and tags he had stolen from prison laundry bags around his neck, then binding this device to a door handle and window catchment and sinking to his knees. He did leave a suicide note on a piece of paper with a drawing of a gravestone engraved with in loving memory, Fred West, Rose West, rest in peace where no shadow falls. In perfect peace, he waits for Rose, his wife. That, was, that wasn't that was the suicide note, that was just a picture with the gravestone. It's very elaborate, isn't it? And then it's Fred as well, who can barely read and write. Yeah, but then you've got the note here. A lot of time to himself, I imagine. Um, yeah. The su <laughs> Yeah. The suicide note read, to Rose West, Steve and May. Well, Rose, it's your birthday on the 29th of November 1994 and you will be 41 and still beautiful and still lovely and I love you. We will always be in love. The most wonderful thing in my life was when I met you. Our love is special to us. So, love, keep your promises to me. You know what they are. Where we are put together forever and ever is up to you. We loved Heather, both of us. I would love Charmaine to be with Heather and Rena. You will always be Mrs. West all over the world. That is important to me and you. I haven't got you a present, but all I have is my life. I will give it to you, my darling. When you are ready, come to me. I will be waiting for you. So they keep your promises to me, you know what they are. It sounds very, very sinister. Again, and that's the thing here. Obviously, there's apparent 18 other um, victims, which we 
I've not found out anything about since. Maybe it's her keeping a silence about that. Yeah. That is the most empathy from Fred West you're ever going to get. Deluded as well. He thought he found a soulmate within Rose who shared all the kind of interests and, and loves and wants that he, he wanted. So maybe that's, the, he, in his eyes, it's his soulmate, which is, yeah, it's, it's a horrible thought. So the 3rd of October, 1995, Rose's trial began at Winchester Crown Court. Rose pleaded not guilty to 10 charges of murder. The murder of Charmaine West having been added to the original nine after Fred's suicide, and two counts of rape and indecent assault of young girls have been dropped with a view for later resubmission. So it seems like Fred's suicide actually got her another charge. In his opening statement, the prosecutor portrayed the Wests as sex-obsessed, sadistic murderers. Against advice, Rose took the stand, dressed in black and easily angered by the prosecution. She did not come across well. When questioned about life at Cromwell Street, Rose claimed she and Fred had lived separate lives, which was inconsistent with her earlier testimony of witnesses who had visited or lodged at their address. In reference to her relationship with her eldest child, Rose admitted her relations with Heather were strained before claiming to the court that her daughter was a lesbian who had physically and psychologically abused her siblings. Most disturbing was the evidence given by Fred's own daughter, Anne-Marie, and that of former nanny, Caroline Roberts. So this is Caroline Roberts, who we mentioned earlier on, who was the nanny for a short period of time, and then she escaped, or she was let go, promising that she'd be back, but then she dropped her charges. She bitterly regretted not having given evidence back in 1973. Of her court appearance, she said, When I went into the witness box, I could see her up to the left, and all I had in my mind was, I'm going to face her this time, because I felt so guilty about not getting them a prison sentence the first time around. If I had gotten them a prison sentence, probably Probably none of these girls would have died. Rosemary's counsel tried to discredit prosecution witnesses as either having financially exploited their connection to their case or motivated by grudges. So the 7th of November 1995, Janet Leach, Fred's appropriate adult, was called as a witness by the prosecution in rebuttal to the recordings of Fred's confession, which had been played to the court previously and in which he had said that Rose had known nothing at all about any of the murders. Leach testified that through his role, Fred had gradually begun to view her as a confidant and had confided in her that on the evening prior to his 25th of February arrest, he and Rose had formed a pact whereby he would take full responsibility for all of the murders, many of which he had privately described to her as being some of Rose's mistakes. Fred had also confided that Rose had murdered Charmaine while he had been incarcerated and had also murdered Shirley Robinson who was pregnant with Fred's child. Fred had also confided that he had dismembered the victims and Rose had participated in the mutilation and dismemberment of Shirley Robinson having personally removed her child from the womb after her death. Leach testified that Rose had played a major part in the remaining murders. The 21st of November 1995, after seven weeks of evidence, the judge instructed the jury, emphasising that circumstantial evidence can be sufficient for finding of guilt. The jury returned unanimous guilty verdicts for three of the ten murders on this day and the remaining seven on the next. Determined her crimes appalling and depraved, the judge sentenced Rosemary to life in prison, emphasising that she should never be paroled. Initially, Rose was incarcerated at HMB Bronzefield as a Category A prisoner. So Fred's body was cremated in Coventry on the 29th of March 1995 and only four family members were present uh, for the ceremony. His ashes were scattered at the Welsh seaside resort of Barry Island, which I didn't expect. Barry Island being Gavin and Stacey, the two families were obviously famously called Gavin Shipman and Stacey, Stacey West. West yeah. So yeah, there's a little link there. So as you mentioned there, obviously with a few, mem- a few family members attending um, Fred's funeral, um, I watched a documentary, I think it's called A Killer in the Family, and it had um, his brother John and John's daughter in there as well. And throughout it, it was very, the whole documentary is making the point that obviously the victims of the crime, obviously their, their families are all victims, but as well as the, the person, the killer themselves, their families, their change as well, the reputation being associated to that person and all mm-hmm. these things as well. But there was a kind of feeling when you're watching it that John, he's, he's trying to apologise on behalf of Fred, but it, it, there felt a weird energy, obviously knowing that what I know now about John, apparently, you know, he was basically was going to be tried for the raping of Anne-Marie, uh, Fred's daughter. And he, he actually went on to hang himself before the court case. The jury apparently were about to find him guilty. But in that documentary, this is obviously a side before, he was apologising for Fred and stuff. And now you're up with this in hindsight. It's mm-hmm. a very... You kind of do feel the weird energy when you're watching it. And yeah, that's one of the really disturbing things about this case is just the interchanging, like, incestuous nature to all of this, which then made some of them think that's just how you interacted with family. It was, yeah, it was horrible. Yeah, and I think as well, just obviously the the, the graphic torture that all of these individuals went went through just before they died, it's unimaginable the amount of pain that they were in and the amount of suffering that Fred and Rose put them through, but also the number of victims that are still not 
been identified or uh, I mean there was there's allegations that Fred while in Scotland and while operating as a as an ice cream man of all things had killed a boy, run over a young five-year-old boy and got away with it he obviously had that allotment that was kind of concreted over for a motorway so yep. all the women that they could the, all the individuals that were kind of coming and going from that house as well kind of reminds me a lot, in a lot of ways about the, the kind of John John Wayne Gacy case that we yeah. covered when that got he converted his basement into kind of a, a, a bit of a party house obviously there is the other end of the house with Fred and Rose to take people upstairs but well, yeah. still burying victims in the yeah, yeah, yeah. cellar and the yeah. crawl space yeah and in terms of the aftermath with Rose uh, being in prison a documentary by Trevor McDonald uh pal that we've mentioned before he talks about um rose west and mara henley their untold story but apparently they both became grew close in jail bonding over similar crimes and then they had an affair which called apparently when they became rivals to be in prison royalty so yeah two massively known serial killers in the uk prominent female serial killers having a love affair in prison which is it sounds stranger than fiction i mean all, all of this does seem so very surreal uh, rose apparently was rep- was treated like a queen in prison and g- engaged in lesbian flings throughout which apparently afforded her special special luxuries. She apparently tried to woo another infamous inmate, Tracy Connolly, who was the mother of the toddler known as Baby P, by making her breakfast in bed. And once she was crowned Star Baker during a 2018 prison competition inspired by the great British Bake Off, she won with a Victoria sponge. It doesn't sound like she's having a particularly bad time in prison. And we've said before sometimes with these cases and certain people who live such kind of out of control lifestyles, mm. once they're getting put into a situation where they're institutionalized yeah they somehow find their rhythm yeah some sources say that she's been heard in the prison cell talking talking to fred at night but that sounds like one of those stories that maybe other prison prisoners just sell to the paper uh she's allowed to shower on her own have her own sewing room she's religious now and apparently god has said he's forgiven her which is great news for her um, it's amazing how god just does that sometimes <laughs> yeah she gets all these like she has a coffee machine and tv and radio a fluffy rug and she's known as auntie rosie in prison So both of Rose's oldest biological children and her stepdaughter, Anna Marie, initially visited her in prison on a regular basis, although by 2006, she had ceased contact with them after May began asking questions about her kind of part in the the murders. Rose justified her decision with the explanation, I was never a parent then and could never be a parent now. The sole visitor Rose continues to receive in prison is Anna Marie. Some recent news that happened, which I think um, we we got tagged in quite a lot, and you know a lot of people were interested in. On Friday, the seventh of May, twenty twenty one, officers were called to the Clean Plate Cafe in Southgate Street uh, by a production company filming a documentary about. Um, Fred and Rose. They reported that they had found possible evidence to suggest a body could be buried within the property. And this body was of Mary Bastong, which we mentioned earlier on about um, going missing. So Mary worked at the Clean Plate Cafe at the time, and this is a place where West's first known victim, Anne McFall, was also employed. And, and West has apparently has confessed to killing Mary in conversation with his son, but never admitted it to police. So the production company were filming there, a follow-up series to the 2019 documentary Fred and Rose by Trevor McDonald. And apparently the production team had spotted what they believed to be blue material buried underground because Wes had worked on this building during the time. Blue was the colour that Mary was seen wearing the last time she was seen. So finding this and knowing that he'd worked on there, Mm -hmm. they kind of called the police in. However, this was a false alarm and nothing was found. So yeah, that sadly wasn't the closure the family wanted. But um, yeah, there was a lot of press kind of circulating the case then after that happened. In 2004, one of the West's youngest children, Barry, claimed to have witnessed the murder of his sister, Heather. According to Barry, who was seven at the time when he came forward with this information, Fred and Rose had restrained, then sexually and physically abused Heather before Rose had repeatedly stamped upon her head until she ceased to move. Which if you can, I mean, what, what other reason would Barry really have to come forward with that information? It's absolutely hideous isn't it so in october 1996 the west house um, along with the adjoining property was demolished and the site made into a pathway every brick was crushed and every timber was burned to discourage souvenir hunters yeah you can imagine people would uh, yeah. take a bit of that it's a huge case there's a lot of names a lot of people in here we've tried to be clear with it i hope it hasn't been too confusing with uh, us going between different family members and different from different uh partners yeah. it is a very convoluted case and and it is believed that there's many more victims out there as well that you know still haven't been reported on um but yeah it's, it's a very deep case it's a very extensive timeline but um yeah we thought we had to kind of cover as much as we could as possible yeah as we said at the start this could easily have been kind of a three or four parter um there's there's more than enough information out there for us to have done that but we try and kind of condense it to around an hour 
or so. Um, so we, yeah, please excuse our brevity with that. So a, an odd news story I found one just kind of Googling things for this case was Vic Reeves targeted by killers Fred and Rose West because they thought he was a girl. Uh, so there's pictures of Vic as when he was a young, a young lad and he had long hair. So apparently Vic and his friend were, um, in 1979, were hitchhiking the way home from Glastonbury Festival when they were picked up by Fred and Rose West. Jesus. But once realising that they were they were young men, they just dropped them off. But they, yeah, that's how he began, that's, it says that's how I came to be picked up by Fred and Rosemary West. Uh, which, yeah, you never would have put those two together. No, not at all. Another lighter note, um, NZTV, a uh, uh, New Zealand-based breakfast talk show, were tricked into celebrating the anniversary of serial killers Fred and Rose West. Um, and they ended up actually, it went quite viral on Twitter. But they basically put up the very infamous photo of Fred and Rose together, uh, saying they were long-term fans of the show and wishing them a very, very happy anniversary. It's today that Francis and Violet Eastwood celebrate their 30th wedding anniversary. I love it. In February of this year, it was reported that Rose West had become the latest of Britain's notorious prisoners to receive the coronavirus vaccine. Apparently, she was uh, she was classed as being clinically extremely vulnerable due to her weight, and now she now even struggles to walk up the stairs. But she apparently suffered a bad reaction to the AstraZeneca jab and was in bed for days. Um, apparently, and apparently, she's a huge fan of Strictly Come Dancing and Dancing on Ice. Apparently, she gets a friend from outside to, to vote on her behalf. <laughs> on that, we'll move on to the look e likeies for this case one of them i found very very difficult and the other one i found quite quite easy uh ben mm. do you want to go first yeah i've got limited numbers for both you'll be happy to know um St- ch- i'm stuffed what chuffed is chuffed and stuffed stuff <laughs> chuffed and stuffed are you yep fred west looks like wrestler mike freedom and his tag team partner by the look of it a little bit harry like harry kane, kane. Yeah. For Fred as well. That is such a bad job. <laughs> I struggled, to be honest. And I also thought young Fred West, there's a picture of him about to pop a bit of food in his mouth. Young Fred West, and I'm probably paying him a bit too much of a compliment here, looks a little bit like Pete Wentz from Fallout Boy. That's not... Just that photo with the open mouth. But... Yeah, that's not... Yeah, it's not your, not your worst. But... Thank you. <laughs> Fred uh... West, I'll, I'll just do my Fred's as well. Sure. Yes, yeah, so Ian, Ian Jury from the Blockheads. Um, I got for Fred. It's a pretty good shout. And I also have the Mungo Jerry singer, Ray Dorset. For Rose, I've gone for, I struggled with Rose, Cynthia from This Is England. And it's Joe mainly. Hartley. Is that her? That is her. Did but you go for the same person? Exactly the same person. But I put, I don't think they are a strong lookalike, but just, I reckon she could play, she could play her in something. Yeah. It's, it's just literally that picture, isn't it? glasses. Yeah. It's really tricky for him. Um, Rose. So let us know if you guys have any Rose West lookalikes. But yeah, I had exactly the same one. Yeah. Ben's looking at his Gloucestershire facts. We don't need any more of those. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Gloucestershire makes one hundred million pounds a year from the Cheltenham Festival. There you go. No more of those. So that was the case of Fred and Rose West, the House of Horrors, a nightmare on Cromwell Street. As always, thank you so much for listening, for watching. If you are listening, please go ahead and and, and leave us a rating or a review. Please continue to keep telling your friends about us. We really, really appreciate that. If you've got Instagram, follow us. We're so close to 5,000. It would really appreciate it. And we're very active on there. And if you're hungry for more, we have got a Patreon page. And if you're hungry for merch, we do have a merch store, icmap.store. And we've got hats, we've got stickers, we've got a wide array of things, mugs over there. So we'd appreciate any support there. But guys, like we always say, we say this every time. Keep doing what you're doing. Unless we're renovations and extensions. And- Ice cream, man. Cheers, guys. See ya.